how do you manage that overwhelming wave of data, how do you manage all of the different types of services, you almost are mandated to start changing the core of the network to get ready for that. If you look at the way that networks are evolving, it's moving everything towards the cloud. So of course we have to focus on software as a key element of the mix. Of maximum importance for us to keep the standards uh, evolving in the best way. We should work together on that standardization, that interoperability, and kind of feed off of each other to drive that innovation cycle. You gotta make sure that you're embarking on a transformation on the people front as well as process front. Service providers, over the top guys, application providers, car manufacturers, all these verticals, we're going to have to work closer and closer. A lot of our customers are standing up voice over LTE for the first time. They've got a simple choice, am I going to buy a box to do that the old fashioned way, which will become a boat anchor in five years time, or am I going to license a piece of software and deploy it on standard off the shelf hardware, in which case it'll live forever in my network. It's a very simple and easy choice to make at that point. Drive some of this standardization, but leverage that NFE platform, whether it's virtual network functions onboarding or federations or API standards, etc. So we become more software centric. And as we all know, software is king. That's the, the way to success. What, what, what is your take on this? When we were talking off camera before we started, you said, you know, basically, I've seen this before. Can you explain? It's, it's a fascinating evolution to watch because most of my career have been in communications, but I was in cloud and enterprise for about four and a half years, and my job was helping automate and onboard functions and features. Um, orchestration was a key part of that. And I also watched the enterprise go through the evolution of, of the whole experience. We want to get out of HR having their own server in the data center with their name on it. And so then the great triumph the next year was we have uh, decoupled the software and the hardware together in a virtual machine, but it's one app on the server that you had one app on last year. So you go through this whole evolution that I watched the, the service providers going through with, I got one VNF going, yay! Oh, where's the next one? And, and it's just a normal part of the journey of being able to take something that has been purpose-built and has been solely owned and going into a decoupled shared resource model. And, and I do find that there are a couple areas where I think service providers could be more specific and concrete. Um, so things like standard benchmarking, I do think if you look at the enterprise and the cloud environment, you had Google and Facebook throw code into open source and say, if you want to know how you can be more competitive in my market, go run that and show me the results. So it was very helpful for the suppliers in that ecosystem, in that evolution, to know what am I pointing at in this new world? Because uh, you don't have the same kind of dimensioning when you have five EPC boxes that make up the application and it serves a million subscribers. Well, what does that look like on a server that's running uh, possible different memory configurations? And, and so we have to be able to help them go through that. But the operators can help by being concrete and saying, go that way. Here's the APIs. Here's the benchmarks. Here's the performance characteristics that we expect. Um, and, and maybe not putting five nines everywhere would be, would be helpful as well. Just a suggestion. <laughs> um, but also, I've seen the suppliers have done a really good job. I've been surprised how quickly that they have moved forward in, in initially saying, that's great. You can have SDN and NFV, and it's sort of the joke about Ford. You can have anything you want as long as it's black. Um, but there's a significant amount of diversity supporting different hardware suppliers with VNFs and with uh, orchestration capabilities or supporting it with your hardware using somebody else's VNF and orchestrator. And I think we're just working through going from simplicity to diversity. Um, Network Builders has been really along this journey to try and help. Um, but again, I think as long as we can be specific and concrete and set out very clear, measurable goals, it will be um, we'll make we'll continue making steps. Right. Okay, Comment. gentlemen, go back to it. Go on. <laughs> maybe, maybe just a word here before we go back to the SaaS. I mean, as somebody that came from from IT, I mean, I think it's just important to highlight, and it's something that I, I, I inside the company highlight quite a bit. You know, in, in the IT world, we started from pure software, and it took over ten years to cloudify. Right oh, yes. through the very very slow virtualization, then the fast virtualization, then the cloudification. Mm -hmm. 
And here, I mean, we're talking about going from specialized hardware right. to cloudification. And we're doing this in less than half that time, right? So something should be said at least That's very uh, true. To, to the pace we're at. That's uh, very true. I do remind all the, the telecommunications uh, service providers and their suppliers tend to be like, I know I'm telco, and, and we move so slow. And it's like this uh, myth that we continue to tell ourselves as an industry. And you are moving faster, and it is moving faster in many ways than other industries. So I think that it's a very aggressive transformation, and I wouldn't minimize the, the steps that have been made already. Okay, thank you. Jihan, can I bring uh, you back in again? Yes, please do. Turn back in the <laughs> software as a service debate. Wherever you'd um, like to go. Because it's, it's one of my points. I, I don't know if I want or if uh, we want as CSPs a software as a service uh, delivery model, as you said. But at least I think we need and we want it as a pricing model. Because if we want ourselves to be able to offer, uh, to deliver or to create new offers on the on-demand type, which is the basic uh, promise of the SDN and FE, mm -hmm. to be able to manage on-demand services, on-demand offers, and so on. So if we want to uh, uh, enhance our portfolio with this type of offers, then we need a kind of back-to-back uh, -back with, the, with the pricing model of the vendors, especially the VNF ones. And that's where I come to the uh, pricing model of the software as a service, even though it's not the delivery model, at least there is this question of uh, uh, pricing that is kind of pay-as-you-grow or pay-as-you-use that allows ourselves to, um, to develop this type of business. And I think at the scale of the industry, it's a benefit for all of us because we will be able to develop new revenue streams based on this type of promises. So oh. I, I agree. I just, again, would like to, to, to add that, you know, we, outside of SaaS, mm -hmm. right, we, we offer software in hosted format right now, mm -hmm. right? We, we have been for, as long as I can remember, I mean, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the challenges that we had right, as a vendor when we started talking about SaaS is whether hosted is considered SaaS or not. So from a technology perspective, it's not. Mm -hmm. From a pricing model, it, it might be. I think the pricing model is easy, OK? Uh, easier. <laughs> <laughs> the face went. <laughs> um, yeah, so how it comes that you negotiate so... Indeed. So, <laughs> so, so, so what I would point out, right, is... Can you, can you take a couple, couple objectives? Of the Hang on a second. Question. Sorry. Go ahead. Sure. So, so understand, it's not I inherently hate SaaS as a model, and I agree with you, right? The, mm -hmm. the delivery, the way we would deliver services to our customer would be SaaS, um, and so the pricing model has to line up to the way we work with our partners. Our, our primary, and listen, we do actually use our partners in a way you've mentioned where we take a segment of the solution and have people deliver it. Um, where it falls down is where the core service is delivered in that model. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not necessarily an economic or a philosophical argument. It's an end user experience perspective. It is you know, theoretically possible through the use of APIs and good contractual stuff and knock-to-knock -knock peering that you can deliver a coherent, rational user and user operational experience in that model. It's just stunningly rare that, it, that it's that smooth and it really falls down when you need it the most. And so when you get overly reliant and, and people are operating a core service completely outside your infrastructure using a separate delivery team, the amount of energy that you have to put into making sure that that's not fully visible to the customer at the worst point in time. Um, the, 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 the smoothest of those operations is just that generally falls down. So in the, when I'm using it for a fairly narrow function, absolutely an option. But we're seeing increasingly people sort of developing an enterprise-first strategy and then you know, where they want to host it for the enterprise customers and slapping a CSP pricing scheme on it and saying, there you go. And by the way, if, and then we're retreating back to the old model where I got to spend $50 million up front for you to convert it to, quote, my model. Yeah, we're done with that, right? That's not going to happen anymore. And, it is, you know, and, and so, I, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense for us, and that's not the mark of someone we're going to partner with. Yeah, I would, I would just interject that um, SaaS, it, 
the, the, the conversation about five nines everywhere is really one of those things where we saw um, many of the data centers and even the cloud service providers, they bifurcate their architecture. So you know what's mission critical really is on mission critical architecture. And what can be hosted with SaaS, well, th that's hosted with SaaS, but they don't mix the two. They're not fooling themselves into thinking something that is a core network service would be something that you would want to host as a SaaS on someone else's cloud. But expense systems, expense reporting, just from a data center view, of course, you can absolutely do that. So I think it's more about intelligent design design and being purposeful about what the requirements are for the given service and then being sure you design to those requirements. No, I'm and, and think about it, I mean, you know, most enterprises today, right, move the core features, core services that they consume uh, into consumption in SaaS, sometimes completely with an unknown infrastructure behind it. They just trust the providers uh, of those uh, cloud services to deliver the service at high quality. Um, in, in many ways, I mean, I, I see this as, as an evolution, right? When, when a provider offers SaaS, right, whether they're a traditional vendor that is transforming or whether it's a, a startup that just started this way to begin with, right, the, the SLA matters. And I think SLAs, right, will become more the discussion than, you know, where exactly it is hosted. Even within your own infrastructure, right? I mean, so, I'm, so I we're one hundred percent on board with that as a model. The service is the way we deliver, mm -hmm. and, and so, and I think the way we collectively work together. I think your point about this is part. You know, the, the, our suppliers need to be part of that ecosystem that's delivering mm -hmm. to the new mode, right? A cloudized right. model of delivery of services. And the exciting part about these these solutions is they're not either or solutions, as you right. pointed out. It's all about enabling people to pick the right mix of performance, cost, and security associated with the business value of the transaction they're trying to solve. And for the folks that get that and can partner with us to make that happen, you're just accelerating us all along, right? The explosion in, in cloud didn't take place because they built a more efficient way to sell services to the data center engineer, right? The cloud sales pitch went straight to the CFO and straight to the CIO, and, and it was a way of consuming services and something that aligned much better with people's business, um, business needs. And, and we have the opportunity collectively as, as, as an industry to make that transition as well. And so that means coming out of models where we shift risk to where, you know, in, in, in ways that are not natural to the revenue flow or, 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 we, or we front load stuff or we try to you know, lock it in. It just says, if it doesn't, what I would encourage people to do, back to my point about, you know, the SaaS piece about the end user experience, right? This isn't a, a, a philosophical bias towards one delivery model or another. It's all about is the experience what the end user expects? Is it what they're willing to pay for? And, and similarly, you know, if you really want to know what your North Star is in terms of what you should be aiming for, it's what's the best possible alignment with the customer's outcome and business process, you know, outcome business processes and, 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 and the way that they conduct business. And that should guide everything else that sits underneath that. Lynn, you mentioned a few minutes ago APIs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're becoming more important. Why is that and what's the next step there? When you're trying to do de any level of decoupling, you need a stable place to land. And if you look, um, you can look at tons of different examples. You can look at the Apple platforms. You could even look and go way back in time um, to Microsoft Wickle the Windows Hardware Quality Lab. You had applications that tested on top of the API, and they were decoupled from the hardware that was tested underneath the API. And so it allowed um, these ecosystems to evolve somewhat decoupled, and a lot of innovation could happen. And in a similar way, you look at what cloud services are doing with new applications getting hosted on the cloud. You can spin up a new application, test whether it works or not. Is it popular? And if not, you just kill it. And if it is, then you make a decision about the demand. You've got a number of companies that started out with SaaS-hosted applications, complete startups born in the cloud, and then they realized, hey, wait a minute. For that money, I could, I could do a data center or I could be hosted in somebody else's architecture. And so they pulled it back in. Mm. And so it's really a much more intelligent way of designing, how am I going to deliver these services? And are they going to be something like Pokemon Go that's there for two months and goes away? Or is it going to be something that is a file encryption service that everyone needs when they're trying to interact and, and move files around? For, for me, it's not only the question of stability, which uh, is very true, of course, but it's also the question of interoperability. And mm -hmm. you talked about the service, the cloud service providers. They are in a very different dy dynamics than we are. And the 
DNA of telcos is the interoperability and the, the basics, I suspect, of the new uh, interoperability will be the APIs in the future. So it's really key for us and it's a collective need from CSPs and from uh, vendors that we specify that even we standardize these APIs. It's, it's not only a, an implementation, uh, it's, it's really a standard uh, that we need if we yeah, want to I, I would say if you don't standardize it, it will end up standardized. There are stories of uh, storage instances on a specific cloud that vendors built APIs right to that instance because it was a de facto standard. Mm -hmm. And so you can end up with some of that. And it's not necessarily the best architected API for every cloud. So I think it's contingent on the service providers and the vendors to say these, these are the standards. So, so these are approximately the, the two models, right? Either you have a de facto platform, you mentioned right. Windows, right? You want to run on Windows or not, yeah. right? Or standards, where you need to define it before many implementations get finalized. In this space, I feel we're a little bit stuck oppose, in between. I don't oppose the two, and I don't consider that one should be prior to the other. No, I'm not saying one is prior to the other. I'm saying yeah. these are commonly used mechanisms mm -hmm. to get compatibility. Here, we're a little bit in between. We have yeah. almost an API defined by standards, but not completely. right? And then we have several platforms fighting to become de facto standards. And they're not compatible among them. right? So, I mean, from a VNF perspective, I can tell you, right, I mean, depending on which uh, area we, we deal with, which customer we deal with, we need to accommodate, you know, an Etsy belief system, a TNMF belief system, a proprietary belief system, uh, a self-made belief system, right? Everybody's saying, okay, this is my standard, right? But I, I consider that to make it viable at the ecosystem standpoint, we yeah. should... Uh, solve this and consolidate or converge, I don't know how to phrase it. I, 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 I agree. Which one should we use? And, and it's, not <laughs> it's not only this question of interoperability, it's also the question of viability of the value chain at the end of the day. So Absolutely. Like, Let's over index, right? I mean, people want to pick the winner all the time, and that IP, that didn't happen. Right? I mean, it's just, you can pick all sorts of examples you want to. However, there's some things that people could do, again, in the standards community, with each other, and this is people are so worried about giving up a, a market advantage by standardizing around something that doesn't match them as the baseline. And in fact, if you try to apply a Pareto analysis that sort of said, all, you know, all of us collectively know that we are not differentiated on 80% of what the customers exchange for basic capabilities, and you create a mechanism in the standard for you to be special for your particular implementation, you would take a ton of pain out of the end user experience and offer a better thing overall. Again, focus on the end user customer experience, focus on what the business is trying to achieve. If you applied that Pareto analysis and just nailed out that 80% that you're all the same anyways, despite what the marketing brochures say, and then really focus on on um, the differentiated piece as an addition on top of that, you'd, we, we'd all benefit from that in terms of the way of just making things work together, being able to move a higher step in the business. Right now, we're all so focused on a feature function comparison between pseudo boxes, right? And, and in fact, there's a whole layer of value we can add by, by starting to, to abstract that, that, that capability up one layer and then building workflow management across that. That's a whole sector that people haven't captured yet in terms of value to the end customer that will never happen if we can't get over trying to be the one who controls the 85% of the API spec that none of your peers are gonna agree on, yeah. right? And, 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 and it, you know, we encourage that because you know, amongst the carriers, there's some disagreement about which standards to accept and, and in amongst the vendors, there's not a lot of, of, of coordination and collectively, we end up offering a less than ideal experience to the, to, to the folks that purchase our services.